Greetings and welcome to this week's COVID Chats and Facts, sponsored by the UAMS Division for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. As always, I'm your host, your favorite diversity specialist, Amber Booth McCoy. And this week, we are going to talk about addiction during the pandemic. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we spoke with Dr. Tiffany Haynes, and she came and told us that it's okay to not be okay. We talked about stress. We talked about managing stress, behave, uh, managing these different behaviors, um, depression and anxiety, all of that, and what it can look like during this time of uncertainty for everyone. Today, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into that topic and talk about addiction, um, coping mechanisms, behaviors that we're forming that maybe we may not be realizing are forming, especially during a time when um, liquor stores and dispensaries are considered essential businesses. So in order to talk about that today, we are going to hear from our friend, my friend, excuse me, mentor and colleague, Dr. Eric Macias. Dr. Macias is a psychiatrist as well as an epidemiologist. He is an associate professor in the UAMS College of Medicine, and he um, oversees faculty affairs. So please welcome Dr. Eric Macias. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Macias. I, I'm so glad to be here. It's good to see you. And uh, I wish you could be together in person, but we're gonna this because we're gonna be good enough for some time now i would say at this point this is the norm i may not ever go outside again after this half of the world opens up so. that would be a, a real loss <laughs> for the world uh, if i stay oh. home that would be fine so no. let, me stay, let me stay home and you go and and, and and make the world a better place well thank you so we know right now that now is a time of uncertainty. It is scary. There are people dying all around the world. We keep hearing numbers about cases growing, going up, but people are going outside. It sounds to me like it might be the perfect time to be drunk or high. The, uh, the governor has deemed these necessary businesses, and we've seen reports on CNN and other news channels that um, alcohol sales have increased drastically since then. Should we be concerned? Like addiction is a real thing. Yes, we should be concerned. And it's important to understand that. And that's the, 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 main, the main problem of addiction. addiction. Addictions are short-term solutions for long-term problems. And yes, on the short term, getting intoxicated, either drunk or high on something may feel good. But in the medium and long term, you're going to pay a huge price for it. So, so these are ways we cope with anxiety, with our fears. And now there is a lot of anxiety and fear out there. So for people that have substances, addictive behaviors or substances as the way to cope with fear and anxiety, they're definitely having a hard time because they are going to what they, how they know to, to, to take care of their fears. And, and that can get out of hand very quickly. And that's, that's, the, that's when addiction can, addiction can create a real problem in your life, can affect your relationships, your family, your friends, and your work. Okay. Now, if, um, if I were, let's say, an alcoholic or an addict prior to the pandemic, then I already, you know, already know that I have this issue. For those who may not, right? Someone who's not an addict, they've never been an alcoholic. What should they be concerned about? Can they develop that during this time? Is this, you know, can, you can't catch addiction, right? But is this something that could develop because of that? Yes. And, uh, and that has to do with exposure to something, right? So you and I have an interest in public health. So one way that we, we think about issues in public health is about people that are exposed to something, people that are not exposed to something, and you can follow them over time and see if they develop an outcome or not. The outcome may be addiction. So lots of people are being exposed now more to alcohol and other drugs. So a subgroup of people uh, will likely develop a, a, a addiction. So what do we mean when we say addiction? Addiction has to do with loss of control. 
So one thing is that you can sit down and drink a glass of wine. The other is that you can sit down and you cannot stand until you finish the bottle or the second bottle. You lost control. Now it's not you controlling how much you drink, but it's alcohol dictating your life. Addiction is all about losing control. To me, the best way to think about addictions is a situation where you lose the ability to control your own behaviors. And that will get you to, that will get, lead to a series of behaviors that are associated with addiction, craving for the substance, withdrawals, uh, doing stuff to get access to whatever yeah, your addiction is. So all, no matter what the cost is. So people will do stuff um, that they, they normally would not do uh, to, to get to their, to their addiction. So addiction is about losing control. Okay. Um, in the view of losing control, because we hear a lot about the behaviors and or addiction being ascribed to morality, that loss of control is psychological, right? Like the ability or is it like a, a compulsion? You know what I mean? Is it something that, you know, can you train yourself to not if you, you know, want to? So if that was the case, addiction would not be a disease, right? It would be something that you do because you want to. But that's it's the, it's the opposite of that. Addiction is something that you do even when you don't want to. It, your brain becomes this machine of habit that you can no longer control. So, so be, uh, addictions can be associated with substances like alcohol, cigarette, nicotine, which is, uh, comes in cigarettes, uh, cannabis or marijuana, uh, cocaine. So addiction can be associated with substances. We also know now that addictions can be associated with some behaviors. So the number one behavior we all know is gambling, right? Some people, most people can go and have fun and, and gamble and go home, but some people can't. They get exposed to gambling and they cannot control their gambling behavior. So that's, that's, that's when we talk addiction, right? Now we are seeing a whole generation of, of young, young people, mostly men, but also women, associated with a video game addiction. Right, so video games they are created to 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 use the very same all these substances and behavior they use the same brain area of the reward system, so they give you a sense of reward, and you keep going for it, you keep going for it. There are classical experiments that show uh, um, that when you make a a mouse addicted to um, to crack cocaine for example it, it will it will neglect food and water and sex for wow. the addicted substance. Even in a mouse? Yes, even my, yes, wow. even mice. Even mice can get, can get addicted to some substances. Wow. So we have, so what we have done with chemistry over the last hundreds and some years is that we develop a series of, of substances that make, that concentrate the power of some very specific uh, molecules, right? So the, the greatest example is opium, right? Opium is something that has been in human history for thousands of years. But that's opium from the poppy seed. In, within the last 150 years, uh, scientists and chemists started to develop ways to purify opium, to develop morphine, and then to develop mm. heroin, which was developed to fix the addiction to opium and to morphine. <laughs> and then they noticed that heroin was even more addictive. And then you create other substances that concentrate opium, concentrate the, the active compound of, uh, of opioids, and they will become more and more powerful to the point now that we have something like fentanyl, which is even more powerful than uh, uh, um, the old morphine wow. or, or, or uh, so they, they made a, a feel-good drug to help and then that one went wrong so they made another feel-good drug yes. to make the old feel-good drug not work and now yeah. <laughs> it sounds like we we don't listen to the to the to the um 
to the lessons of history, right? And you and I talk, to, talk a lot about history in our conversations. But for example, the first opioid epidemic that happened in the United States happened after the Civil War with veterans of the Civil War that got addicted to, to morphine. So, so we have now a second epi, ep, uh, opioid crisis. So we didn't learn from the first one, and now we have the second one. This one now has to do with these new compounds, and more than the new compounds, new ways of preparing these compounds to concentrate them, things like oxycontin and, and all these, these, these new preparations of opioids. So, so, so we, have, uh, we, we know where this leads to. This leads to extremes, right? Yeah. So the one extreme is uh, there was a point where you could buy these drugs or if you get a prescription for it, and then we realize it was too much and then we make them all uh, illegal. Mm -hmm. So then it went all the way to alcohol during prohibition, right? right. So then we, we lose stuff again and then we realize that it's a problem and we close again. What we need, the lesson of history is to learn moderation and to learn to find. And the other lesson that I discuss with my patients is to realize that there are some people that can drink. And most of us are able to drink with no problem. But there is a group of people that for, for which alcohol is toxic and that they cannot handle alcohol and they will have to stay away from it. It I doesn't mean all of those people. Uh -huh. I went to college parties with those people. <laughs> yes, so people that cannot handle alcohol, alcohol can be very destructive. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize that, that a legal substance like alcohol uh, can cause withdrawal syndromes that is even more uh, uh, dangerous than some substances that are considered illegal, right. like cocaine or marijuana. The withdrawal syndrome is much lighter on those mm -hmm. than with alcohol. The, the alcohol withdrawal syndrome is very well described and it can take, can get you to an ICU and can kill you. Wow. So I want to go back to the reward system you were talking about. Um, is the reward system in our brain based on any specific hormones? Like, is it, there are so many, what, gap, uh, epinephrine, yes. norepinephrine, like yeah. all of these different yes. hormones and chemicals. Like, so what is being activated when we're talking about the reward um, system? Right. There are some substances that are called neurotransmitters. And these are molecules that one brain cell uses to talk to another brain cell. The reward system, the number one neurotransmitter for the reward system is something called dopamine. So dopamine releases this, gives you this sense of accomplishment, reward, pleasure. So what the brain, what happens in the brain so we, is that so, you so learn. We, so we need to figure out how to put dopamine in. in <laughs> <laughs> yes. Instead of opioids, yes. it's more dopamine. Yes. It's a, okay. Yes. So, so dopamine uh, so, uh, it, 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 it is a molecule that is in several areas of the brain. And uh, what happens with dopamine is you get release of it. When you drink caffeine, you get release of uh, dopamine. When, you, uh, um, when, you, um, when, you, when people drink or they use their addictive behavior, is the feeling that you get. Dopamine is the molecule that makes mothers attached to their babies. Oh, How powerful okay. is that? Wow. How powerful is that? It's the wow. most powerful feeling in the world. The mother and the baby, dopamine makes the, the, the breast release milk. Wow. So, so, so oh. this little molecule, the most powerful force in, in human history, the, the love of a mother to a child right. <laughs> is at the root of addiction. <laughs> it's <scary. laughs> <laughs> it is because I'm addicted to my sons. I love them. Oh my gosh! Right. And and it's a control thing. You're right. I can't stop. <laughs> yes, it's incredible. So it's extremely powerful. So when this is okay, so the the reward system is activated. I like this feeling, right? Because dopamine yes. is tends about to loving on on my you know son and such. Yeah. And then I do it the next day, right? And the next day, well, isn't it going to wear off? Like, isn't it going to not feel like that eventually? Kind of like if I have too much, won't the dopamine, is dopamine gonna stop? Or am I gonna, what, 
Yeah. yeah. Dopamine doesn't stop, but there are changes in the brain that we call tolerance. And that's actually quite dangerous. So, and I'll tell you why. The t tolerance is the, is the, is, is the phenomenon, is, is a situation where you need more of the same substance to get the same effect, right? Mm -hmm. So people, for example, people that use opioids in the, in the, in the, 19th, in the, in the 19th century, in the 19th century, 1800s, uh, they used to talk about chasing the dragon. Chasing the dragon would mean that you have this incredible feeling the first time you use, use morphine and uh, opium. And uh, in the rest of your life, you're going to be chasing that, that feeling again. Mm. Because you're never going to get it again. Because that's your first time. So, 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 so what you're describing is called tolerance. Now, why is that important to know? It's important to know for the following reason. I'll just give you a, a quick example that we can all follow. So suppose you need, I don't know, 10 grams, 10 milligrams of, of uh, suppose somebody needs 10 milligrams of opioids mm -hmm. to, to, to get high. And then they get used to 10 milligrams and they need 15. And then they need 20. And then they need 30. Right, so they need more and more. Mm -hmm. So, so now their life becomes their whole life becomes. Oh, how do I get the next high? How do I get to this amount? Now, because my brain is trying person, to get back to that to that first feeling. Yeah, so you're just trying to back to, but now you need more and more of the same substance, right? So you develop right. tolerance. Now, here's what happens, and I've seen this happen. I've seen somebody die because of this. So now you need thirty. Then you go to rehab or you go to, you know, you get a treatment, you, you, you try to get off the drug and, mm -hmm. you, and you detox and you go, it goes away and a year later you relapse. Mm -hmm. But now your brain, it doesn't need 30 anymore. 30 is going to overdose and it's mm -hmm. going to kill you. Oh, wow. So that's why sometimes the most dangerous part of addiction mm -hmm. is that relapse cycle. Mm -hmm. When you relapse, and then you start to use the same amount. Well, that same amount now is going to kill you. You're not okay. used to it anymore. So tolerance changes. The brain is very plastic. Mm -hmm. Our brain is very plastic. It changes over time. So we are born with, you know, with a brain and, and the environment is changing it. That's, that's why uh, uh, the brain is this incredible organ that changes with, with, with the social environment. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to understand all the time the relationship between the social environment and the brain. Because the, the social environment is changing the brain, but the brain is also changing the social environment, right? It's this incredible wow. relationship. Wow. It's like uh, the nature versus nurture argument, you know, and the tautology, I guess, you know? Yes, yes. That's the, 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 how much of this is learned. Mm -hmm. How much of this is something that you you born with, right. and and I think that is a very important discussion. It's a fun philosophical discussion from a practical perspective for somebody mm -hmm. that is dealing with addiction. It's very it's very easy to 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 to, to understand. Mm -hmm. There are people that can handle this stuff. There are people that cannot, and if you cannot, you should stay away from it. Uh, we know this because when you expose a whole population to some substance. Some small group of people get addicted. Most of us would not get addicted, even to most, even to opioids, even to crack cocaine. Don't. But if, but if you are a, have a, if somebody has a tendency to get addicted, mm -hmm. be aware of that and try not to get expose yourself to these toxic substances. Okay, so um, when you were talking about addiction and the behaviors like you're saying there are people who can drink and they could yeah. have a drink every day after work and yeah. that's fine right mm -hmm. the issue you were saying is the loss of control it's when i can no longer stop having a drink right, right. so i'm fine or you know it, let's say i am in this co this uh pandemic i've been shut in i have been drinking more than you know normal but like i can stop if you will i'm not going to be upset if we run out of wine you know wednesday night so i should be concerned when it's wednesday night i don't have wine and we have to go find it or you know yes so so when you can no longer control 
the behavior. The alcohol controls you. Uh, addiction is about losing control. So that takes us to a very important question that I think we need to make sure we get to our ears. And that's can you can you can you get can can you get out of an addiction? How do you get out of an addiction? The answer is yes, you can. You can get out of an addiction. However, you need to respect your brain. If your brain has that tendency, for the rest of your life, you're going to need to monitor, mm. try to stay away from the substance. And the most interesting piece, you need to find an alternative addiction. You need to find an alternative to your brain. So, so you, have to, you have to fight an addiction with an addiction. Yes, you have in a way to you have to find something that you can get that high. And I'll tell you, some of my patients with addiction became some of the best athletes that I've ever seen because they turn at that brain mm -hmm. into bicycle, you know, into into swimming, into so so you get that brain that has a tendency to get stuck in these loops, neural loops, and you and some of them become amazing pastors in some church because they now can use that power mm -hmm. to engage with the audience and, and to find their, their transcendence and to communicate their feelings of, 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 of religiosity to other people. These are great people. Okay. So um, if we're talk when you were talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, getting off and things like that, if the loss of control, all of these things, are bad. Um, you know the saying when white America catches a cold, black America gets the flu? Yes. So if addiction is already bad, what does it look like in minority populations? What happens if I, you know, someone of minorities, if you are, or is there any data that suggests who, you know, who's more likely to use or anything like that? Are there things that I should just know, this is what I need to be aware of because this is what I have up against? So addiction affects all races and all ethnicities. The problem, the, the, the challenge for minorities is that they may not be at a high risk for, to be, for addiction. That's not clear. There's no, no clear evidence that some groups has a high risk of addiction. But we know that, that if you are a minority in this country, you are at high risk of being arrested you, high, you have a high risk of being persecuted. You have a high risk of not having enough money to pay for an expensive attorney. What makes the, 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 the final outcome of that is that minorities, I don't believe they have a high risk of addiction, but they have a high risk of incarceration for the same addiction. They have a high risk of being, uh, 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 of serving longer sentences. They have a high risk of being, being shot. So, 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 so we, we have to understand that our country has a tremendous amount of inequality. And the inequality is not about, the inequality is about access to healthcare. So, so if you was, are, mm -hmm. right, if you- I was if, just if, thinking that if you're, I mean, it's not just the incarceration part, but if I'm a service worker or my job doesn't carry insurance on part-time employees and things right. like that, then access to treatment looks completely different than somebody that, you know, is able to go to a fancy rehab, you know, in other places, things like that. Yeah, so, so it's a double hit, right? So, so it's a double hit. On one side, you have more access to, to being persecuted and to be incarcerated, and then you have less access to being treated right. and to be cared for. So that's what makes this so unfair, is that some groups of people are, in a way, targeted by our system of, of, of organizing the society. And at the same time, they're not given a chance to get the proper treatment, to get the proper diagnosis, and to get to rehab facilities or to receive proper care. Okay. Um, what if I have... <clears throat> I'm going through this, I'm not uh, drinking, I'm not, you know, I'm, as far as the addiction is concerned, but I don't think I'm handling being shut in and things like that well. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm just not coping and I understand that it's okay to not be okay, but I'm at a point to where I'm, I'm really 
not okay. You're sick and tired of being not okay. <laughs> That's it. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. So what happens when I get there? When have I reached a dangerous point, if you will? What am I looking for? So the these so so as a psychiatrist, I, I have to break these symptoms in terms some people so when some people are when people are under stress, they fall into specific modes. Some people get depressed and they get very sad. Uh, some people get very anxious and they are always afraid. Some people get psychotic, right? So you have all these responses to stress. May I, may I pause you for just one second? Yes. We use these words um, all the time, right? Like crazy or psychotic, like just in our vernaculars, in our culture. But yes. being psychotic is an actual diagnosis. This is a yes, diagnosis. and crazy is not. And crazy, crazy is not, right. You keep crazy, you explain crazy, I ex explain psychotic. <laughs> I uh, explain crazy. So what is psychotic? What does that mean actually? And not just the way we use it every day and, you know. Yeah. There, there are two core psychotic symptoms. One are called delusions, when you have fixed false beliefs. And the other are called hallucinations, when you have a perception without an object. So mm -hmm. a typical delusion is that you believe that People from Jupiter are monitoring your thoughts through a satellite that's floating over Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. Right? So that's a delusion. It's very unlikely that's true. It's mm -hmm. very unlikely. Uh, uh, hallucinations is when you say you hear voices or you see things, and, and there are all sorts of hallucinations. The most common in psychosis are auditory hallucinations, audi hallucinations uh, of hearing. Really? That you hear things that are not there. Yes. So you hear voices. You have voices talking to you or talking about you or giving you orders. Those are some of the most common auditory hallucinations. Okay. So now, I, so I got you off track with psychotic. I apologize. Right. So, 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 so different people would fall into different patterns, right? So when is it a problem? The key, the key marker for a psychiatric, these things are out of control, is that they cause impairment. So impairment is you cannot function anymore, right? Okay. They cause a significant amount of impairment. You cannot function at work. You cannot function as your, in your family uh, uh, group. You cannot function in your community. So there is impairment. And the other is that there is distress. So the feeling is distressing to you to a point that is not normal. So there is a normal degree of distress that we are all feeling right now. I mean, right now, this is a time we're living in an incredible social global experiment in stress. All of us, all human beings in the planet are now afraid of getting sick, afraid somebody you love is getting sick. And in the United States, you, you add to that the fact that if you get sick, you may not have enough funds to pay for the care that you need. Mm. So we need to... Um, and then, and then you have the, 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 the social restrictions plus right. that, the social distance, right? You yeah. and I are now recording this from, from, from our houses far away because we are now isolated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are bombarded by news that are mostly negative. Mm -hmm. So that creates a series of, of, of process in your mind that all of a sudden is all extremely negative. Mm. And the one thing we need not to lose is hope. Hope is the most important uh, is the most important feeling that one can have. Hope is the idea that there will be a better tomorrow. And for us, uh, um, we have to remember that. That's part of that's part. That's why we fight for a better society. That's why we fight for a better job. That's why we fight for a better life. Is that because we have hope that this will come someday, that things will be better. So, so is it, it's important. If I've lost hope. hope, is that so? I mean, if I've if I've lost hope, like there are other things, like if, let's say the distressing. You know, I understand if I'm I'm distressed, yeah. distressed, um, anxious. But essentially, if the hope is gone, then that's that's very serious. We're saying hope. Yes, yeah, very serious. Hopelessness lack of hope is one of the key risk factors for suicide. Mm. 
when do people commit suicide? When you don't have hope anymore. Yeah. You despair. You despair because you don't believe that life is ever going to get better. So hope is key. Hope keeps us alive. So, so it's very important that we share this idea that there's, there is a better tomorrow out there. It may not be, be tomorrow, maybe next year. So better take care of yourself. Make sure that you are, you are alive and well next year mm -hmm. because there will be a next year and there will be a year after that. And, and things are not going to be all like this. Things change. I agree. And I am, I'm excited, honestly. I, I mean, there's a lot going on, but as a diversity specialist, what I feel like I'm seeing is a new cultural landscape. We are having to remake so many things and redo the ideas that we had about our jobs, who needed to be in the office. If anything, we've proven apparently no one needs to be in the office. Um, <laughs> I mean, so the accessibility that changes now, you know, with employers now thinking, oh, okay, well, maybe we can have, you know what I mean? Like you can recruit differently if you're fine with someone working from home. Right? Yes, yes, yes. But, but, but you, you, you have been a great teacher for me in the, in the, in the issue of privilege. Mm -hmm. so I want to remind you that to, to work from home is a privilege. It is. There are tons of people out there that cannot work from home that they have to go to that meat packing plant right. or somebody needs to get that meat ready. Sure. That they have to go to that McDonald's to prepare the food, that they have to go to the grocery store. There is no working from home if you're doing chefs, shelves in a, book, in, in, in a, in a grocery store. So yes. working from home is one of our privileges. And that yes. privilege is not equally distributed in the population. No, it is not. Most of these people that are having to go to work for sanitary workers, mm -hmm. food workers, people, people, people in, in essential services, they, there is a disproportional number of them that are minority, members of minorities. Right. They're, 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 they're one they're of the reasons they're getting sick more. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons they're getting sick more. I was thinking, well, and even when I think about though, the, this new cultural landscape and not just like me working from home is a privilege. I also feel two months, three months prior to um, the pandemic, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have called your, uh, uh, your trash man an essential worker. So the way, we, so to me, the yes. landscape includes us reimagining who's important in society. Because yes. right now, to me, the superheroes are the people that are at Popeyes that I can still go and pick up my chicken, that I can still go and do these things that provide me some sort of normalcy. But I'm sure it's very scary to them, you know what I mean? Like, yes. because they have to come in contact with so many people. I think that's part of this new landscape that we're building. Yes, but, but so, so the essential feature for that, for, 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 to take the, your thought further, mm -hmm is that we need to value them and pay them better. Agree. It's very important that we do that. I mean, we have to find a way to have a society where people feel value for the work they do and they get paid enough that if you have a full-time work in America, you should not be at the poverty level. To me, that's very simple. To be, this is not about left or right, uh, capitalism, socialism. It's a very simple logic that if you work full time, that work, that, that amount of work should be enough for you to have a sense that you are above poverty, poverty at this point. And I think that that is a perfect way for us to go to break. You have been listening to COVID Chats and Facts. My name is Amber Booth McCoy, and we are here talking to Dr. Eric Macias about COVID addiction and more. So we hope that you will join us again after this break. What? Thank you for joining us. You are here listening to COVID Chats and Facts, and we are here, of course, every Friday beginning at 11 o'clock today. We are talking with Dr. Eric Macias. So if you missed the first half while he educated us on addiction, what addiction is, um, what it looks like, then you are lucky that you're here for the second half. 
Dr. Macias, again, thank you for being here today. No, oh, thank you for having me. I'm glad, glad to be here. So we um, talked about addiction. You did explain to us that it's a lack of control um, and that the issue is when I you know, can no longer stop. And then even during when we talked about coping mechanisms, you explained that, you know, if the if I still have hope, then I, you know, I'm still in a at least an okay place, right? Yes. What are my steps when I no longer have hope? Or I've gotten to a point to where maybe I'm hearing something. Where do I go then? Do I call? Mm -hmm. Do I just go to the ER? Do I call, you know, my family practice? Like what happens? Yes, so so the emergency room is always an option if the, if it's if it's if it's an emergency and people should understand that if you go to the emergency room there there should be psychiatric uh, social workers there that can help so so that can be a, a way to get help um, if you discuss these feelings or or emotions with your primary care physician it's very likely that he can start the treatment or may may refer. Uh, uh, one to um, a, a mental health professional. Now, mental health professionals is, is a very broad group of people. And uh, I'm a psychiatrist. So psychiatrists are those that, those that went to medical school and did, it after medical school, four more years of training in psychiatry, which is to diagnose and to treat mental disorders, including the use of medication. So psychiatrists can do that. There's the other group to consider are social workers, Social workers, they do three years of uh, a master's degree training in social work, and a lot of them do extra training in psychotherapy. They are wonderful psychotherapists, and the, the, basic, the basic mental health approach for treatment is a combination of psychotherapy, which is talk therapy, which is when you go to somebody to talk to them, and medication. So, so I would think, it, think of it this way. Another group of people are psychologists, and psychologists are people that they have a doctoral degree in psychology, and they can do testing, they can do diagnosis, and, and they can do psychotherapy as well. So psychologists are very well-trained in terms of psychometrics, in terms of measuring the mind, in a way, and giving diagnosis. Finally, these days, we have uh, PAs that specialize in mental health, Wow. And they can provide not only a, a, a diagnosis, but also treatment in terms of medication. And we have nurses. There are psychiatric nurses, advanced practice nurses. So these are APRNs or advanced practice nurses that have extra training in order to diagnose and to treat mental disorders, including the use of medication. So the, the, the group of when I say mental health professionals, I'm talking nurses, social workers, psychologists, PA, physicians. Uh, and so, so there is a, a lot of people that are trained to help address these issues. Okay. Um, is there anything that I'm looking for specifically? Like, you know, a lot of times you look up um, a doctor and they will tell you, you know, they may be family practice, but they specialize in diabetes or, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Do I have to go to one of those health care professionals that's specifically trained in addiction or can I go to any of them and maybe it'll all be, you know? I usually tell people to go to, go to the one that you can get an appointment with because if that person is, that person I'm assuming is well trained, whatever specialty they are, nurse, social worker, PA, physician or psychologist, if you need a referral to another one, they will help you and they will help you find that next step. Because it's true, there are psychiatrists, like I'm a general psychiatrist, so I, I treat everybody with psychiatric disorders that is an the, the adult. However, there are psychiatrists that specialize in, in, in addiction. So addiction is a specialty of psychiatry, is a subspecialty of, of psychiatry. So there are those that, and we have some wonderful addiction psychiatrists, say here, for example, at the UMS, my great uh, friend, Mike Mancino, is a very good uh, a psychiatrist who is, who is a specialist in addiction. And he takes care of, of uh, people all the way from, from all around the state. And I hear great things from his patients. Okay. Um, when you were saying, if I go to one, right, and let's say it doesn't 
work out. It can feel like, like, is it going to feel like dating? Like I'm going on a bunch of first dates, but isn't, isn't that what I need to do or should I not hop around? You know what I mean? Like, how do I know or if I'm finding the right one for me? I, if I got in with the first one and they refer me or all of that, when I decide who I'm sticking with at this speed dating mental health table, how do yes. I make that decision? It shouldn't be speed dating, <laughs> um, but, but there, is a, there is a degree of matching between you and your mental health professional. So it's important that there is trust that you feel that you care for, that will, will care for, and that that person has your best interest in mind. And in my experience, the vast majority, the vast majority of mental health professionals meet that criteria. People are well-trained and people want to help. So I would strongly encourage people to look for help. There is a strong mental health system out there that will help you uh, with either mental health disorders, like depression and anxiety, or with addiction disorders, whatever the substance is. So I would strongly encourage you to engage with the mental health system because these are people that want to help. Okay. Um, now, what can I do? Let's say I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, what can I do? I can feel my behaviors changing. Um, they may be a little you know, unhealthy right now, but I, I can still stop. What are some practices I need to start? What are some healthy coping mechanisms that I can use? So the number one is find a substitute, find a substitution, find something, find something healthy that you can occupy your time and your mind. So as I said, some people that may be engaging with their church, some people that may be engaging with uh, an exercise group, some people may be engaging with a reading book club group. I don't know what it is, but find something that is actually healthy and start spending your time. A lot of people, <clears throat> when they go through a, a addiction, they do have to change their friends. They do, they do have to change the people that they interact with. Mm -hmm. um, one of example I tell, tell people all the time is I was talking to this patient once and, and, and I asked him, as part of my, my assessment, I asked, do you use cocaine? And he looked at me and said, of course I use cocaine. Everybody uses cocaine. Well, it's everybody that he knows. Right, so, right. So, so it's true that for him, everybody used cocaine. Right. And I was there, maybe one of the first persons he met that did not use cocaine, <laughs> never used cocaine. So, 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 so it's important to break that. We create these, we create these ideas of what's normal. So if in your peer, if in your group of people that you interact with, drinking or using this drug or that drug is normal, is the norm, you're gonna to have to change. And sometimes that's a huge challenge. You're gonna to have to change your, your group of people that you hang out with. Okay, you have to um, do something new if you want something new, right? If you're looking to do something different. Yes, yes, what they say is, if you want something you never had, you need to do something you never did. Okay, um, that is, if you will, we're looking at the coping mechanisms. We have a couple. I've been doing well. Let's say before the pandemic, I was doing well um, and I was already using those. I was in a 12 step program, all of that. And then I've relapsed. Am I able to start again? Like what, like, am I just, if, if I failed, what does that mean for me? Does that mean it that does. I'm gonna do that? Am I gonna fail for the rest of my life? Unfortunately, uh, um... Relapse, it's, uh, it's fairly common. Most people relapse at least once or twice before they find a, a way to stay sober for a, a real long period of time. So relapse uh, is part of, uh, of the process of, addic of recovering, of getting out of addiction. It is a lifelong process. And, uh, and you know, Mark Twain supposedly said, quit, uh, quit smoking is easy. I've done it a thousand times. So, so, so it's, uh, it's stay away from that substance. It's, it's, it's stuff. And sometimes you have to, unfortunately, hit um, rock bottom. And some of an addiction patient of mine told me once that, yeah, you do that many times. So, so it's, it's not about hitting the bottom. It's how many times you're going to hit the, bo the bottom. So. And I think even um, what you just said, 
made me look at something different. You were saying that um, relapse is part of the process. And if you look at it as part of the process, like it's not over, not only is that hopeful, we were talking about, you know, yeah. having mm -hmm. hope that in, it's not a failure, it's just the continuation of a lifelong journey, right? Yes, yes, and that's a very important framing. You, you hit on something that, I, 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 that I've been using quite a bit, and there, is, there are three ways you can look at somebody uh, that, that is kind of bothering you, or that, that somebody that, that you're worried about. Mm -hmm. um, you can look at that, that, that person is a problem. You can look at that person has a problem. Or you can look at it as that person is in the journey of learning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, so I would definitely try to uh, give people the benefit of the doubt mm. and that people are not trouble. People are not problem. People have problems. And for most of us, we are trying to learn how to live our lives. And we need to uh, give, your, give each other a break. That's the, something else I'm telling people all the time right now, including myself. Uh, give yourself a break. Uh, 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 take, take breaks uh, during the day and during the week. And this, we're going to need to go this for the long run. This is, a, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. And we're going to be in this new mode, I would say, for at least six to 12 months. Great. I mean, we do have to bunker down or hunker down, as they say, hunker down. And yes. then when we're um, pausing to just kind of be patient, remembering that we're all going through this at the same time, uh, I was telling a friend that right now, during this pandemic, I feel closer to people I've never met on continents I've never visited because I know we're going through the same thing, you know, yes. like it's, it, there's this unifying aspect of it. Um, when <clears throat> you were talking about the, the journey and doing something new and even the empathy that we can, you know, have during this time, I like to also remember that I'm the only part of this I can control, right? The yes. news changes constantly. The numbers change constantly. The advice, wear masks, don't wear masks. Put, put Lysol in your veins. Don't put Lysol in your veins. <laughs> take this medicine. Take that medicine. Um, come to work. Don't come to work. Who's essential? Not essential. All of it can seem so back and forth and uncertain. But if I am the part that I control, that means that maybe my schedule looks like I know that it's sometime today I'm going to sit still for three minutes or I'm going mm -hmm. to, you know, all of that. Then yeah. it's a small piece of this uncertain world that I get to, you know, kind of control. Yes. And then it's very, very wise that we try to remember what is it that we can control and what it is that we cannot. And, that, and that's the whole uh, uh, um, serenity prayer mode, but we need to try to remember some of that. There is an important caveat to that, and mm. I think is what is our responsibility? Mm. And that's why I agreed to come to this program with you, even uh, if I'm tired and if my schedule is booked up and I'm trying to catch some time off, <laughs> what's our responsibility? Mm. And he here is where I stand with you. Amber, is that our responsibility is to inform people the best way we can mm -hmm. so certain rumors do not get diffused in the population right. and that will add to the burden of disease that is affecting populations mm -hmm. such as minority populations in our state. We need to inform we have we are healthcare professionals and we are going to we have a responsibility to help uh people and um, i want to make sure that you know that i appreciate the work you do i know that you're doing lots of stuff <laughs> and uh and i'm very impressed by that each one of us we have talents and we should use our talents to help each other so i appreciate that i um, I say it all the time, but I absolutely mean it. I love what I do. Um, and I love the amazing people that I get to do it with. It is 
I didn't know as a child that diversity was a field. What I knew was I was going to speak up for those around me who could not speak for themselves. I was always going to fight for what I thought, you know, was, um, was fair. Um, not equality, but equity, you know? Yes. And, um, then I found the field of diversity. So I get to do all of that. If we can, what are resources, what are websites, what are phone numbers that I can reach out to during this time if I'm having, you know, if it's time for me to contact someone, whether it's through addic about addiction or mental health or stress, anxiety, all of that. Right. So th there are several resources around the state that people should be, uh, should be aware of. Um, and of course, your first resource is always your family, your friends, people that you trust, and people, of course, they are not uh, also um, having issues with addiction. So it's important that we remember uh, to look for these friends. Um, I always encourage people to consider their, uh, if they have a church, um, if they have a, a group of people they trust, that they should try to, um, to make sure, reach out to, to those. Um, so tell to someone. So the first thing I need to do is tell someone around me. Tell someone, yes. Tell someone that you trust and they will, they will help you. Okay. Uh, the second is going a little bit beyond that group is to consider your, say, if you're involved with a church, a church group. Mm -hmm. that, 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 and there is data to show that involvement in churches pre, uh, protects people from, from, from mental health as well as sub substance use. And I'm not, I'm not talking about a particular church. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the church that speaks to you. Gotcha. And, and, and maybe whatever church. Okay. Um, uh, the other group of, uh, of, the other resources that people should know are AA and NA meetings. Uh, these meetings, uh, you're going to find a group of people that are in the same road of mm -hmm. trying to get control of their addictions. And I'm a big fan of the AA and the NA uh, um, modes. Um, finally, your healthcare provider, if you have a primary care physician, don't, don't let the shame of addiction mm -hmm. uh, uh, prevent you from getting the right treatment. So discuss with your primary care physician discuss with your nurse, discuss with uh, <clears throat> somebody from the health system. Finally, in Arkansas, we are lucky. The, the UAMS psychiatry department <clears throat> has, work, has worked with the state to create a hotline. Oh. It's called Arkansas Connect. <clears throat> and that number, and I'll go ahead and give the number is 501-526-3563. I'm going to repeat that. 501-526-3563. There's also a 1-800 number. Okay. 800-482-9921. 800-482-9921. Arkansas Connect was created to help people access help. They will provide help over the phone. They will provide uh, referrals if you need further referrals. So this is a wonderful resource that, that is now available to everybody in the state and that people should use and get help. Don't is, it let, expensive? Yeah. is it expensive, Dr. Macias? It's free. Wow. So should call people should call in i need you to say that one more time it's 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 <clears throat> how much yeah so everybody <clears throat> this is part of the the, the the an effort by ums to provide support to everybody mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 there may be some fees uh but 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 you should call they will tell you they will tell you. give it give them a call awesome. because they can refer they can help it's available to you right now through your phone so it's awesome. I love that. Well, I want to thank you again several times, a million thanks, because you always show up anytime I've asked you to show up. Um, 
And I appreciate that. Is there anything that our listeners should know? Any last words or sage advice that you would like to give before you get out of here? Sometimes people want to say that we all in the same boat. Unfortunately, that's not true. We're all in the same storm. We're all in different boats. Some people have boats that are very comfortable. <laughs> Some people are in little rafts. <laughs> so we need to remember that we should not assume anything about people. Uh, there are people out there that are struggling. And I want to make sure they have uh, access to some of these resources. And this number, the numbers that I gave that are UMS numbers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they may ask about your insurance, but you will be taken care of no matter what your insurance status is. I love that. And we are not going to discriminate in terms of documentation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I want to make sure that uh, people know that there are people out there that have trained and that they have chosen to devote their lives to take care of other people. These are the healthcare workers. All the way from your primary care physician to your very specialist, uh, top-notch surgeon at UMS, we all made a choice many years ago to, to, to help people. And we created an amazing healthcare system uh, and we should use it. I agree. And we thank you so much for being a frontline worker and for making that decision to help all of us. As always, I want to remind you to stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands. Remember that UAMS has free online screening as well as free in-person screening. Um, you can go to our website at uamshealth.com. You are welcome to call 1-800-632-4502. Again, that's 1-800-632-4502. You are more than welcome to use all of the resources that Dr. Macias gave. Remember, it is okay to not be okay. And if you find that that is you, by all means, take steps so you can move towards being okay and at least getting to a place where you're able to handle what is going on the best you can in each and every moment. Join us next week, every Friday, 11 o'clock. I will be your host, Amber Booth McCoy, your favorite diversity specialist. We will have a wonderful, guest speaker every single time as we explore new topics. As always, this is sponsored by the UAMS Division for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I'm Amber Booth. This is KBF, Voice of the People. See you next time.